And Jared, take it away. All right, thanks for having me. Um, I'm gonna start with a little bit of history. Uh, I said this before, if you're cooking with me, you can start uh, peeling your potatoes and onions because that's the, uh, the longest part of this process. Um, but it seems like a lot of people are, are watching. So um, hopefully we can keep this entertaining for the people who are cooking and the people who are watching and learning. So um, basically I made the Cholent in advance so that I can take you uh, through the process and I have a video um, so that I can sort of narrate step by step and take questions as, as you may have them. Uh, and I can share that video after. Um, so the story of Cholent begins over 2000 years ago or more. Uh, and it has to do with Shabbat. It's a traditional Shabbat stew. Um, and I'm gonna make the bold claim that is backed up by some of the books that I've been reading uh, that the overnight Shabbat stew known as Cholent is uh, the second oldest Jewish food in history. Uh, the first oldest Jewish food, does anyone know what that is? Nana? Well, we don't, maybe, but I don't <laughs> think we eat that anymore. Chopped That's liver. a joke. Chopped that liver. We preserve. Uh, <laughs> close. I, I think it would be matzah because it's the only ah. Jewish food that is actually mentioned in the Torah. Um, but cholent um, is actually the second oldest Jewish food. Um, and it didn't look exactly like cholent. Um, but it is what made Jews unique because no one else at that time was slow cooking food over 24 hours. Uh, it was not part of the culture, but Jews did this because of the unique relationship between Jews and observing Shabbat and fire. Um, and um, the Hanukkah story, which happened 2100, 2200 years ago when the Maccabees reestablished a Jewish rule in Jerusalem, there were different factions. And one faction was saying, um, we can't have any fire on Shabbat. We can't even look at fire on Shabbat. We can't use fire on Shabbat. Um, and those were the literalists. Um, there were also the interpreters. And those interpreters ended up establishing, they ended up winning out. And those interpreters established two traditions that we use today. Uh, those two traditions include um, lighting Shabbat candles on Friday night and the overnight Shabbat stew. Those were two ways of, of them explaining that actually, even though we're not gonna light fire on Shabbat, we're gonna actually light it before Shabbat starts and end up benefiting from it on Shabbat. So whereas the literalists would sit in the dark on Friday night, the interpreters would sit with their Shabbat candles on Friday night. And so um, serving a hot meal on Shabbat afternoon and lighting Shabbat candles in the window were the way to uh, show publicly that you're on this side of the argument. Um, and um, basically that tradition took hold to the extent that um, in the Middle Ages, they said anyone who does not eat or forbids eating the Shabbat stew should be suspected as a heretic. Um, so that became uh, actually part of the tradition uh, was the Shabbat stew. And as early as the year uh, 200, this appears in the Mishnah in Jewish literature written by rabbis who say that when it starts to get dark, uh, you have to make sure to wrap up your chamin. Chamin means hot things. And to this day, chamin is the word used in Spartan communities for cholent, for the overnight stew. And um, we ended up with cholent because cholent is the translation of the word chamin into Old French. Cholent uh, means hot and slow or hot stuff. So that's, that's how we get the word cholent. Um, so as early as 800 years ago, um, there's record of people as Shabbat was starting, they would take their pots of cholent, they would all walk to the local bakery in the shtetl and they would, who would have a large fired oven that they would all put their cholent pots into. And then he would actually seal the oven with clay because he, people would not be able to really um, cook it themselves on Shabbat, but they would tuck it away, seal it, and 24 hours later, they would come back and collect it. Um, so sometimes you would end up with someone else's chillin' pot, which is other stories. But um, that's where we get the Yiddish expression that says, uh, a son-in-law is like a cholent. You don't know what you're made of it until it's too late. Because the idea is that you're not gonna see your cholent until you eat it. Um, 
And so we preserve that process to this day um, and the process of slow cooking to this day, we start it and then uh, 24 hours later, or I would say 16 to 23 is prime uh, cooking time. Uh, 16, 23 hours later, you have a cholent. Um, and in fact, this uh, slow cooking, we don't think of today as being so uh, associated with Jews. But in fact, um, in 1940, an inventor named Irving Nachumson, who's an observant Jew, uh, received a patent for his device that he made to better make cholent. A lot of people were making cholent in, in Dutch ovens, in clay pots in the oven. And he said, I want a device that's going to make cholent outside of the oven. He called it a crock pot. Uh, and, and patented. And, um, and so you may not have known this, but the crock pot was invented for the express purpose of making chillin. Um, so, um, and this was on NPR a few years ago. So um, that's my introduction. Uh, now we're gonna do a little bit of the cooking. So um, I'm gonna show you my screen and I'm going to start to take you through the, the process. Again, you're, you're going to be doing a 20, 16 to 23 hour cooking process. And you have to start with um, these Reynolds uh, crock pot liners. It's very important. I sent, so all these ingredients and tips are in an e email that we sent out. But um, it's really going to make your life a lot easier to start off with the crock pot liner. Um, you can see the video going now. Um, so when you start off with the liner, it makes it easier to clean. So you see I'm uh, peeling some potatoes. That's the beginning. You're going to peel the onions and the potatoes. And you're going to start to cut them into um, a small dice, like a half inch dice. Um, and I don't know. I want to make sure that I'm keeping pace with the people who are cooking. Uh, so but if, if you're getting bored watching me peel potatoes, I'll fast forward a little bit. Uh, is that anybody peeling? Anyone in the peeling stage? Mm. Seems like people are, are not. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit just to show you. Oh, no, that's not my video anymore. All right. Um, but uh, you're going to peel the potatoes and you're going to um, peel the onions and you're going to cut them into these, this rough dice. Now, um, the important thing is that um, because you're cooking it over a period of 24 hours, you want the um, you don't want anything to burn, and so um, there are a couple things that we do to prevent the burning. Uh, the potatoes are going to hold up the best, and so that's why you put the potatoes on the bottom of the crock pot so that um, so that you make sure that you don't burn the meats or, or the beans or those other things. Um, and the thing is um, also, it's a matter of taste, but uh, I like small cubes of potatoes. Some people like whole potatoes. Uh, it really depends, but I like to go with the um, approach that you wanna get everything in your spoon at once. And so um, I like to, cut in small pieces so I can get a little bit of potato, a little bit of onion, a little bit of meat all in the spoon at once. And so I use smaller chunks, but some people do massive chunks of potatoes. It's really up to you. Um, any questions so far? I don't, know if the, I, I don't know if people are writing in the chat or uh, do we have any questions? I love your gloves. Oh yeah, these are onion gloves. Uh, so I highly recommend them. I can even send the link to that too. Um, but uh, make sure you don't cut yourself. Um, and I can, I, you know, nick myself cutting onions enough times that now I exclusively use the onion gloves. What are you using to line the uh, pot with? So Reynolds, um, the company that makes the, the aluminum foil and the Reynolds wrap, they, they do crock pot liners and it's very, very helpful. Um, and I've um, made the mistake of, not using it and uh, it takes like a week for me to get the crock pot clean. This really is sturdy and even after 24 hours of cooking, you can lift it up with everything in the bag and it won't uh, break. Can you use that liner on any pot or does it have to be specifically the crock pot? Oh, you could probably use it on any pot. I don't know at what temperature it stops being 
it, I don't want it to melt, but you know, at, at the temperatures at which you're cooking uh, in a crock pot, uh, there's no concern. So I would say you could use it. Um, I don't know how it works with other, with like a metal pot, I don't know. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Um, you, so um, I, I have a yeah. question. Yes. My crock pot liner says to put water in the crock pot before you put the liner in. I've never used the mm. liner. Oh, so you will add water later. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. And you're going to add enough water that it won't be a concern. So I don't think you need to add it on the bottom, but um, you will, you will add water. Are these liners safe in the oven? You know, I, I don't know. I think I would guess that if you're cooking, so the alternative to the crock pot is you can put it at a, in a Dutch oven, uh, in the oven at 200 degrees for the same amount of time. Um, at 200 degrees, it seems to work, but I don't know enough about ovens to know whether it's going to melt. So, but um, so we're going to ask everyone to mute themselves, and the question should really go through the chat, or else we're going to have uh, some disarray. So if you have any questions, just type them into the chat. Uh, we do have a question for you, Jared. What kind of sure. potatoes? What about Irish potatoes in a can? Oh wow, canned potatoes. You know. You can do whatever you want. I think that um, I've never tried canned potatoes. So I, I would say, um, again, the ingredients that we're using are designed to be able to withstand 24 hours without disintegrating. And so um, that's why I recommend raw potatoes. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't, and same thing with the beans. You know, a lot of people want to use canned beans. I would say use dried beans because canned beans, um, after a day might be uh, disintegrating. And so you wanna have things that are falling apart and delicious, but um, not gonna completely fall apart to the extent that it's no longer a bean. You wanna um, retain some of, the, some of the integrity, structural integrity of the ingredients so it doesn't just become a porridge. Was that I know you said to say this through the chat, but I just wanna say as a cook, these bags are the same as turkey bags or chicken bags that you might use in the oven. They're fine in the oven, it's not a problem. And I agree, you do not wanna use canned products. You wanna start from fresh because they take all day long to cook and they will turn into mush otherwise. Right, thank you for the vote of confidence. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's correct. And also, uh, I just wanna say also that um, some people really wanna use their uh, pressure cookers or their instant pots. And I just want to say that um, in addition to, first of all, it's going to come out like soup. If, if you can find a way to um, make it in the Instant Pot, you can let me know. But it's, I have not found success. And in fact, um, some people have used Instant Pots to make cholent actually get food poisoning because of the um, beans. And um, you really need to cook those beans for a day or soak them for a day. So, um, so if you're making meat, um, these are, this is the kind of meat you want to use. Um, these are short ribs. They're called flunkin in Yiddish. Uh, and you'll see that in the, on the package. Um, and you want to cook them on the bone. So you don't want to separate the bone because this bone actually provides a lot of flavor. It retains the moisture of the meat. And um, so you want to keep that on the bone and just cut it. Again, you, you want to think about what size of meat am I going to be able to pick up in my spoon? So you want to cut it into spoon-sized bites. So I, I basically um, cut them along the bone there and then maybe cut each one in half. Um, and what you really want to do again, because there's a concern about burning, is you want to take the um, bones and face the bone yes. on the outside of the, of the pot. Yeah, I'm watching. Uh, and the meat yeah, I don't. I don't inwards. think I actually have a recipe for it, and I've made it before. Um, yeah, and there's all these guys here. Yeah. Anyway, so um, basically, um, in terms of the burning, you just want to make sure that the bones are facing the outside. And if you make like a circle around, you have extra meat. You can just toss them in anywhere. Um, but I'll show you the uh, in a minute when I finish cutting these. I'm just going to show you the bowl here. 
and um, that's sort of how you want to arrange it. And now the other thing is I did, I can point out the things I did wrong in this video too. So what you want to do is if you have a kishka, um, you want to make a well in the, in the potatoes and onions. You want to make like a little donut almost so that there's a way to put the whole kishka in there. Um, and be, because ultimately uh, sometimes the kishka ends up coming up higher in the pot than you want it to. And so at the end of the day, you want it to be uniform. You don't want the kishka popping up. So you make like a little well in there um, to, to fit the kishka in. Um, now, the next thing I do is you want to pepper the meat. I do about uh, a few tape, uh, sorry, a few teaspoons of pepper um, just to pepper and season the meat. Now you'll notice there's not a whole lot of seasoning in here um, because you have all the flavors from the things we're putting in, but that, that's a few, tape, uh, a few teaspoons. Then um, I use these dried light red kidney beans. Again, um, if you use a can of kidney beans, it'll be mush. Uh, so you want dried barley and dried beans. Um, I use three quarters of a cup of uh, barley and um, I think like a cup, uh, yeah, like a cup of dried light red kidney beans, but you can use any kind of beans. Um, there's sometimes cholent mix. You can also use that. Uh, and this is me digging that well for the kishka because I messed up and I didn't do it before. So he here's the other, the only other um, seasoning you have besides the pepper here is some paprika, honey, and uh, I use a Telma chicken stock cube. Um, I think that that provides all the flavor you need. Uh, that's where the salt is and um, it, it releases a lot of flavor over the day. And so um, uh, two tablespoons of honey, two tablespoons of paprika. And then the other thing to remember is um, you're ultimately going to add enough water to cover it completely. Um, because if you don't add enough water, that's when it burns. Um, and so you really want to make sure it's covered in water. Um, and you want to use as much um, chicken bouillon cube as, um, as you would to make soup, as if, as if the water you're adding is going to turn into soup. And so, so, Jared. So Jared yeah. Before you yep. go on, um, yes, we had some questions. Um, yes, so I don't want us to get too far into the process. No, pro no problem. Um, so one question was, um, are you putting the ribs around the potatoes and onions? So I have sort of like the potatoes and onions as like a bed on the bottom. And then again, we don't want any, the meat is most ah. likely to burn if it's touching the edge. So you want to make sure that no meat, flesh meat, you know, is touching the the edges of the pot and so to protect the meat you're going to put the potatoes on the bottom as like a layer and then you're going to put the the ring of the meat around with the bones facing the edge so all the meat's going to face inward um so that's why you arrange it that way and um so yeah the meat's on top of the potatoes if that answers if, the question if we bought short ribs how would you cut it so these are short ribs um are you is this, um, you're asking about London uh, or English cut short So ribs? those are short ribs. So how did you, so you cut them how? I guess they're asking what's your method. So, so I, um, if I have, um, here, I'll show you, I'll demonstrate on this, um, this, okay. So this is a, if we pretend every USB is a bone, right? So I just cut between each bone. And so that way you have basically one bone per piece. And then I, then I take the little piece and sometimes I'll cut it in half. So every bone, maybe I'll get one piece that's on the bone and one piece that's just beef without the bone. Excellent. And what is the order of potatoes and onions into the crock pot? Do you do potatoes first, then onions, or onions and potatoes, or it I doesn't do, really matter? I do potatoes first, um, but you could do a mixture. Um, yeah, I do potatoes first and then um, um, and then the onions. and. And it's going to get basically all the, because of gravity, right? You want all the stuff on the bottom that's going to absorb all that good um, moisture and, and flavor. So, 
So the potatoes and the onions are really gonna absorb that from dripping down. So um, that's why you put them at the bottom. Okay, very good. We have some more questions. So before we go on. Hey, I, I'm ready, I'm ready. So I assume the Hazan Alan Kritz is your Hazan? No. No, all right. Well, he wants you to know, wants all of us to know, he, his wife uses both short ribs on the bone and plunkin without the bone. So it can be done both mm. ways. So okay. very good, very good. Yeah, no, I, it, it's okay to put some meat on there without the bone. Yeah, um, but uh, I would say if it comes on the bone, keep it on the bone because I've tried to make this with just like beef stew meat and that didn't come out so well. Uh, one of our participants said his food store, oh, pretty good, has both trolling meat and he wants to know how that compares to the short ribs. Well, I don't, um, what cut of meat is it? What cut of meat is the chillant meat? I don't know. It's, it's, okay. I'm sure it's flanken. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's probably the same. I mean, flanken is short ribs from the flank of the cow. Uh, so here, here's someone that, this is, a, this is actually good for this cohort especially. He was wondering if there's a lower cholesterol alternative to kishka. Yeah, well, so first of all, um, there is vegetarian kishka um, if you want to make it or buy it. Um, and if it's vegetarian, well, unless it has eggs, um, then it would have less cholesterol if it didn't have eggs. But, um, you know, I think that it's, um, I would say that you don't have to use kishka. I wouldn't say that there's like a direct replacement. Um, but, you know, something interesting is and I was going to talk about this later anyway, but I'll just say it now. Um, the, um, if you want to think about the, so there's this book called Rhapsody and Schmaltz by Michael Wax that you should all purchase. Um, and um, he talks about how Cholent was really the Ashkenazic um, uh, primordial ooze, the big bang of Jewish food. And the reason is because, again, when they were bringing their pots to the bakery at the end of the street, they had to fit everything they were going to eat that was going to be warm on Shabbos in the pot. And so um, they ended up finding these different things to put in the cholent, to cook in the cholent. And so kishka was one of these items that um, they cooked in the cholent because they needed something else. And then it became um, sort of its, its own uh, main uh, item, uh, but it actually began as this dumpling in the in the Cholent and actually they used to do the same thing with Kugel, that they would take a, a Kugel, uh, either a sweet Kugel in its own separate container or um, a potato Kugel and they would cook it overnight in the Cholent and then they would have that as a side dish or they would put the Kugel at the bottom of the bowl and then they would spoon the, the Cholent uh, on top of it. And so, um, you know, that is actually a traditional way, if you're not going to use kishka, uh, to actually put a piece of potato kugel at the bottom of your bowl and serve the, the cholent on top of it. So that's, a, that's an interesting and creative, but also traditional way to do it. And also there's just a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different chol cholent recipes out there. I think I shared some that had prunes in it. Prunes give off a lot of um, moisture and flavor. It's a different kind of flavor, but, um, you know, if you want to go the vegetable fruit route uh, rather than the meat kishka route, there's a lot of different options. So one question is, does the uh, kishka have to be frozen when you put it into the pot? So I typically do put it in frozen. You don't have to do it that way. But it, it, what, it, what it comes down to is, do you want to see where the kishka is or do you want it to be totally blended in with the rest of the cholent? Uh, because if, first of all, if you're using kishka, you got to remember to take the, the plastic casing off because that's a question I get a lot. Um, that's exactly one of the other questions. You yeah, put the whole kishka in, in, in its casing? Right. Well, so most of the casing nowadays is not edible. So, uh, or, so I would take it out of the casing. Um, and, uh, and so, but I do put it in a hole. Uh, again, if you, if you have it defrosted, then it will spread out and there's nothing wrong with that. It will basically meld with the beans and, and you won't be able to tell that there's kishka in it. I like to be able to tell, oh, I'm taking a nice scoop of, of kishka 
with my cholent. Um, so I put it in whole and frozen in the center. Uh, but it's, again, it's a matter of what you want it to look like when it comes out. So um, we have a question that's not trollant. It's about the honey. Are you just mm -hmm. using honey as a better alternative to sugar? Is there a reason you wouldn't use sugar? Um, I just like, I think it tastes good. I mean, and I've seen it in a few recipes <laughs> that's a good uh, answer. With, honey, with honey, so yeah. Very good. Um, let's see. I'm using kasha instead of barley. Would you guess the same or different amount? Um, I don't know. I've never done kasha in a cholent. Um, I think that, um, you know, it, it's certain I, I'm on the, um, I think the conservative side when it comes to barley amounts, some people put a lot of barley. So really, um, if you did the same amount, there's no problem with it. You could even do more, um, depending on how much grain you want. Okay, that's it. That's a lot of questions, so so okay. keep on going. Yeah, great. Great. <laughs> All right. So so again, the um, we've got the pepper, the paprika, the honey, and the uh, bouillon cube, and those are gonna those are sort of the flavorings. And and I'll just say I said this um, when I started. I don't know if everyone was on yet. But um, you've got two types of ingredients here. You've got the stuff that gives off flavor and the stuff that absorbs flavor. And you want to keep that balance. So again, you know, you can, someone's using kasha instead of barley. Um, you know, again, if you're taking out the kishka, you may want to add something else um, that's going to add some moisture and flavor. Um, and if you're taking out the meat, you're going to want to add something else that um, has that. So, yeah, I would say, um, there are a lot of recipes out there and I would say see if you like a combination of different flavors that you like if you want to do substitutions um, but there's no necessarily direct um, direct uh, replacement for everything so here we I'm, have um, two questions about yeah. we have two questions about beans sure. is there a need to pre-soak sure. the beans to pre-soak no, so so that's in most in most recipes you would but because you're cooking this for 23 hours, um, it will soak overnight. So that's, that's the other question. So you are doing it overnight. Yes. Yeah. So, so this, I would say you want to time it. So it's, you know, 23 hours before you want to 16 to 23 hours. I would say, so if you put it in on Friday afternoon, it's going to be ready basically by the time, depending on what time you wake up, it'll be ready at like nine or 10 AM. But, but, um, the, the, the real thing is you want to make sure that there's enough water so that it doesn't burn. And we'll, we'll get to that later. But the, the main concern is not that it won't be done, but that it might burn. Um, so here's the, this is a meat kishka, um, as you can see from the, the beef fat. Um, but um, yeah, so the, the kishka, by the way, anybody here say kishki? Is it? Okay. So, so, a lot of people from um, Chicago say kishki. Um, they, uh, and if you come from Polish descent, uh, you might say kishki and bubby and latki, right? Um, and that's just how uh, Polish versus Lithuanian pronunciations of, of these different words. Um, okay, so hold on, let's see. Um, this, so you see there's a little well, I wanted to make sure everything gets up to the same level there. Um, and um, right, so, and again, if you wanna defrost it, the, the kishka, you can. Uh, I just have it whole and frozen right there in the middle. And then I, I wanna show you, I don't measure out my water. Um, I think that, you know, you start with three cups and work up, but, um, you really want to make sure that, that it's submerged. And uh, you'll see here that I did a bad job. I didn't put enough water. So use this um, when, when I add the water. Is this? Yeah, so you can see that's not enough water. OK, so that, that's what it looks like when it's not enough water. So then um, you want to really make sure that it's all submerged. And after I turned off the, see, after I turned off the camera, um, I added some more water. So what you can do is in the in the hour after you started going, you'll see whether 
the bean tops start looking a little dry. And then you'll see, oh, I need to add some more water there. So you may want to double check um, before you put it in. Um, and then I, um, any other questions there? Nope, nope, not okay. yet. So, so now um, that's really it. You want to make sure again that it's, it's submerged. You're cooking it on low, uh, but this is what it's going to look like when it's done. Um, you see even, even frozen kishka, right? The kishka is completely gone, um, but it hasn't uh, dissipated into the whole rest of the thing. Uh, you see right in the center, there's like a little orange cavern and uh, that's what used to be the kishka. So you can still sort of see where that kishka was. Um, and you see that there's still water bubbling there. If there's no longer water bubbling, it's gonna start to burn. And that's when you know that you gotta, you, you gotta serve that quickly. Um, so that's kind of what you want it to look like or what I want it to look like when I finish. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the end. Uh, so then I think I'm just. Paul Kavod, when are we yeah. coming over? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so any, uh, any questions about anything you heard? Hey, Jared, talk yeah. a little about the different pronunciations. That... Yeah, yeah. So, um. And I, I actually, uh, if it's okay, I would like to uh, let people unmute. And I'd love to hear what people, because the pronunciations, uh, if we're talking about pronunciation, I'd like to hear what people, how people say different things. Yeah, go ahead. If you want but, us to um, uh, unmute, just don't all unmute at the same time. Okay. <laughs> but um, th anybody, does that resonate with people? The Kishki, Latki, Bubby? That's a Boston thing too. Totally oh, yeah? Boston. We never heard that until we came here. It's a mm. Boston thing. Yep, it's a Boston thing. Absolutely. Huh. So it's a Boston thing. So what's very interesting is that different cities, different American yeah. cities, ended up adopting different countries' pronunciations of these Yiddish words. And so, whereas um, people might, you know, really pronounce things the way that their parents and their grandparents did in the old country. Today, people basically take what um, what their um, can you not do it? what the people in their city are saying, and so it ended up being cities that had high, high uh, Polish populations. Uh, <laughs> Chicago, I think, has um, a huge percentage of Jews and non-Jews in Chicago <clears> who <throat> descend from have are Polish descent, and so some of these Polish pronunciations ended up taking over um, in that way. There's also does anybody uh, grow up uh, saying Kegel instead of Kugel? Yeah. 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 So, yes. So yeah. that's that's also Polish and uh, Ukrainian. Um, and so you can actually tell in the old Yiddish um, comedy artists who's from which country because um, Mickey Katz, who's the uh, Klesmer King of Cleveland, um, he... Uh, he has a album called The Most Meshiga, right? Because he doesn't say Meshuga, he says Meshiga. And in his songs, he, um, the chuppah, the wedding canopy, he calls a chippa. So he, he rhymes chippy with Mississippi, which shows you what dialect he, he's adopting. So that's a little bit about um, dialects. Uh, I saw some hand, hands. Um, Gary okay. D D Dalen? Dalen. My crock pot liner is just a little smaller than the crock pot. And the box mm -hmm. says to put water in the crock pot between the liner and the pot. Mm. I've never made this before or used it. So I don't know if I should put water in there. Um, you could put a little bit of water. I mean, you're going to put water in the, in the cholent anyway. Uh, if it says to put water underneath, you can. I, I know okay. some people who have done that. Okay, um, but also, you. I guess my biggest concern is if you said it's too small for your crock pot. Um, it's I don't it's want a little it to... bit small. Like you've got yours over the edge. I, I couldn't get it. But it won't there. spill. I, is it enough that it'll spill out? No, it won't. No. So, no. so then you should be fine. You should be fine. Yeah. Thank you. And it looks like Robert Wolf said, "Can you use stew meat?" I so I I wouldn't I would say um, 
try and get some short rib on the bone if you can. You can use stew meat, but it might get dry. Um, Thomas, yeah. Um, the, it, the liners can be purchased for eight quart pots and that might help her out a bit. Mm. I put in my, my liner, put in my, my cholent, and then I pour water between, between the, the plastic liner and the, uh, and the outside of the, of the crock pot or the inside mm -hmm. of the crock pot. So it's actually lying between the liner and the crock pot. Mm -hmm. And I also use uh, beer instead of the, um, of the chicken broth um, yeah. for flavor and uh, moisture. And mm -hmm. I, I, I usually use chuck stew meat, put it in on top of the beans, which I put on the bottom. Then I have the stew meat and the potatoes on top of that. And that leaves the meat away from the side of the of the mm. crock pot. Uh, that's where the the heat comes in on the side. Yeah. So uh, I do not end up with burnt meat, and nice. I put the cholent on top. The that's the, the best part on top, sliced, <laughs> and stir everything before I serve it. So it's yeah. all mixed up. Well, I, you know, you can do it any. Um, you know that that sounds like a good method, um, and you know you can experiment with different liquids. I. I typically have done, um, I actually find sometimes that the, uh, that bouillon cube ends up adding more flavor than actual chicken soup sometimes. And so um, that's why I end up doing water and the, and the cubes, but beer works. I also, I also use mushrooms, put in on the top and mix those up. Yeah. Um, I, I was once told that mushrooms are not authentic. And my answer to that was, my understanding of the cholent is that it's in, you, you can use whatever's in the kitchen. And I'm sure that my grandmother right. uh, in Russia was happy to, at times to have anything in the, in the kitchen to be able to use into her cholent. Yes. Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, it's interesting because, uh, for, well, first of all, mushrooms are great because they have a lot of moisture in it. And so um, that's something that you can put in that's going to release a lot of moisture, especially, by the way, especially in vegetarian cholents. Uh, but the other thing is, first of all, we did have mushrooms in, in Europe. Um, and um, people have get, become so doctrinaire about what their grandmother's recipe was that uh, we have become very limited in what a cholent can be and what a kugel can be. And, but the fact is that it is authentic. Um, and I have somewhere here, um, if anyone's seen the Vilna Vegetarian Cookbook, uh, it was a vegetarian yeah. restaurant in, in Vilna, Lithuania. Uh, yeah. that they recently translated into English. And um, they have all their recipes. And the fact is you see that, um, first of all, it's a fascinating book because there is no word in Yiddish for vegetarian. The word that they use is milchik, right? Yeah. Meaning dairy. Um, so, but um, you realize that they have uh, mushroom schnitzel and they have pea schnitzel and lentil schnitzel. Schnitzel just means cutlet. Schnitzel doesn't have to be made exactly the way that, that you grew up having it for it to be called a schnitzel. Same thing with cholent, right? It's not putting mushrooms in a cholent doesn't make it inauthentic. Cholent means stew. So anything you put on cholent that you make in this way is cholent. Same thing with a blintz is a crepe. You don't have to stick with the three, um, the three types of blintz that they have at uh, Corky and Lenny's or Second Avenue Deli or any of these restaurants for it to be authentic. So. That's my soapbox about uh, authenticity. It's all authentic. And actually, so, if you go back to the cookbooks of Eastern Europe, you see a lot of diversity in these. So Jared, we have a couple of questions. Why use a chicken cube rather than a beef cube? And what about carrots for sweetness? Yes, you can use carrots. Carrots also, I think, are good in, uh, in a vegetarian cholent. Anything um, goes, right? Yeah, I mean, it, a lot of these root vegetables, again, you may want carrots instead of fewer potatoes and more carrots or um, whatever you want to do. And chicken cube, I like chicken soup. You know, I, I think that, again, if you think about um, French onion soup, right, that's a beef base that has a different sort of flavor than chicken soup. And I think that chicken soup ends up complementing the, the bar. It, again, think about what's absorbing it. The, the barley and the beans are the ones taking on the, the soup flavor. So um, that's, Typically, I, I would make barley in a, in a more chicken broth than a beef broth. So that, that's the less intense flavor I'm looking for. But you can, you can try it. 
You know, there's no rules. Yeah, is there a Sephardic version of Cholent? Yeah, so there is a Sephardic version of Cholent, and it's called Chamin, uh, which we talked about at the beginning. Um, a lot of times they'll use eggs, uh, whole eggs that they'll let boil, um, and they will have a different spice mix. Again, this has very few spices, as you saw. They'll have um, I don't know, turmeric and um, you know cumin and, and different things. And what they'll do is they'll um, create that basically that chicken soup or water, they're going to season a lot heavily with a lot of Sephardic spices and then pour it in. And then they have the, the egg ends up absorbing all that, um, all that flavor and all that spice. So that um, in this scenario, um, you end up getting a lot of the flavor from the kishka and the meat um, and the, the soup. And I see it fewer, fewer uh, Ashkenazic chillants I see with, with eggs because there's not as much flavor for it to absorb. But if you go to Israel, a lot of, a lot of the cholent, the chamin there is, uh, is Sephardic in orientation. Um, quinoa in place of barley. I've never tried it, but um, you know, again, you don't want it to uh, disintegrate. I don't know if there are other recipes you've used with quinoa cooking over 24 hours, then maybe, I, I don't know uh, whether it'll withstand that amount of time. Um, oh, there's also, um, in case anyone wants to know, so the, the first time we actually hear the word cholent is in the year 1260. Um, a rabbi from Vienna was visiting a colleague in Paris. And in Paris, he had this thing called cholent. Again, it's a French word. Um, and in Southwest France, they had chicken and potatoes and barley and beans. That's where we get that component. And then when it was brought back from visitors to, to medieval Germany, they added kishka and kugel and these other very Germanic foods. So um, that's why you end up, it's really a melting pot of these different cuisines in Eastern Europe. Um, other, other questions? I see, yes, yeah, some recipes have a whole egg. Um, someone says, why not parov instead of milchik? You know, um, it's interesting. Well, so first of all, vegetarians, not vegan. Uh, vegan, maybe they would say par. Vegetarian ends up being milchic um, because it has milk and, and cheese in it. Um, but all, also, par of is not actually a phenomenon in the Sephardic world. Uh, par of is a Yiddish word. You can sometimes tell where these traditions come from, from what language it's in. So. Um, because um, Ashkenazic kashrut is, is actually much more strict than Sephardic kashrut, um, we have a word for part of where Sephardim do. Somebody asked about a, a, a co less cholesterol form of kishka instead of the, the kishka, and there actually is made part of kishka. Yeah. Which I don't use, but you could. Yeah. Yeah, it depends what city you're in, whether you can find it, but it's a, it, that's a great option and it tastes the same. Jared, do you keep adding water as it's cooking? No, I, I check it once to make sure that it's submerged and then, um, and then I let it go. Yeah, but I, I check an hour later and see if, if there's too much peeking out or if it looks, you can kind of tell sometimes that the beans look like they're shriveling or, or a little too exposed. Um, and then you can add water. But after an hour into it, I don't look at it again. And it's on the lowest heat in the crock pot, right? Yes, yeah, it's, it's on low. It's on low. By my standards, now, I don't know what Rabbi Leverton would say. I'm, 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 I'm muted. It's... Any other, any other? Uh... He thought he was muted. <laughs> no, I had muted, but I... <laughs> That's any okay. other questions? No, but so, Jared, Jared, yeah. uh, you did a great job. Um, so we've been doing these, as I told you in the beginning, we've been doing these for 
uh, 10 months now. Um, and what was particularly good about your presentation, uh, which I'm now going to set as a new standard, is that you pre-recorded. And that allowed us to, to ask you questions and to follow along. So kol yashkoach to you, a great, great presentation. It actually gave me some ideas for programming, God willing, once we uh, can get together. Because uh, even though I've already eaten dinner, you're making me hungry all over again. It's fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. So thank you so much for uh, for, for doing this. And I, I hope, did you already eat? Was this from last Shabbos or is this? For, is this <laughs> this for was uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, How was uh, it? Delicious, delicious. And I'll leave you all with one last Yiddish proverb, which is schnarren wie der Hund noch cholent, which means he's snoring like a dog after cholent when somebody's out cold. <laughs> <laughs> so what became a tradition on our last cooking webinar is the person who did it, I actually came over, went to uh, her house and she made me a dish. So I'll be over. You live close by? Where do you live? Me? <laughs> LA, yeah. Ah, okay. I guess I won't be able to do that, but that's too bad because <laughs> someday. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, so much. In honor of this presentation this evening, uh, we're going to plant a vine in Israel uh, on your behalf. You'll get that from my email tomorrow, probably. It's called Wine in the Vine. It's a uh, program that we partner, FJMC partners with the Israel Innovation Fund which is a nonprofit foundation that supports Israeli wine industries, arts and entertainment and the Federation Jewish Men's Club. Um, we will then, uh, have our next cooking webinar once I get off my tukkas and plan one. But I hear and I see that I have so many, so many cooks on this call uh, that if you are interested in leading one, I, I would love to talk to you about it. So I'm... Uh, I'm Dean Danny, Mando. Yes. Let's make it a personal appeal. Can anybody teach Homantasha? Ah, uh, perfect good. timing. Doug Segerman. Doug, Doug Segerman. Se I heard that. I think I asked him to turn me down, but maybe if we embarrass No, not him. anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we would love that. So we're going to ask uh, if there's anyone for Homantasha. That's perfect. We're only, uh, we're only a month away. That would be a really, really good one. Or, or another one would be, anybody have favorite Passover recipes as we get closer to Passover that we could do? Another good one. Um, Last year we did, by the way, we'll, we'll probably repeat it, we did a number of different kinds of, of uh, different things you put on the, on the Seder plate. Uh, Horoset, we had about five different recipes for Horoset. And the, the question about, can now, you add wine to Cholent? Um, I have added wine to Cholent. It's fine, and I have friends who add whiskey to Cholent. So again, whatever you have, try it. All right. Excellent. All right, everyone. Well, I think this was great. Everyone have a good time tonight. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank we'll you so tell much. You, we'll tell you after we eat it. <laughs> right. Here we go. All right. So once again, if you're interested in leading, uh, like Tom said, uh, Purim's coming up in uh, around a month or so, and then Pesach is after that, or really anything, anything at all. Um, we would love to, or we're looking for people to lead. You definitely, uh, it takes a certain uh, personality and talent, and uh, uh, but we would love, love to uh, hear from you if you are interested. So once again, thank you very much. And uh, everyone stay safe and uh, have a good weekend. Good Shabbat Shalom. Shalom. Thanks again, Sharon. Well, they say, Shalom, well, thanks. Enjoy, enjoy your cholas. Yeah, enjoy your cholas. This is fabulous. Thanks, if anyone's a new, I'll be happy to come over Saturday. No, I think I'm got a little distance than you. Yeah. But I did the program I went to in the earlier, Men in Stripes, with yes. the three former referees. Great. So Kevin you're you're on the, a roll tonight. Uh, you could probably still get Tom with it, get the next five more minutes. Mm -hmm. You yeah, could be well rounded. Well, Rick and I, hey, Rick, will you send me a, we need a, we need a letter from our mothers? Uh, I need a permission slip. Uh, yeah, I know. We could, we could be in trouble. All right. Yeah. No, but I, I, the Kevin now are doing that thing on YouTube, so you don't have to sign up for it. You can oh, I didn't it. tell everyone. If everyone's still on this call, we, I'm like, you just mentioned that. We record this, and it'll be up on the FJMC YouTube page. Um,
for everyone if you wanted to review what we went over tonight. So thanks, Rick. Thanks for reminding no me. Can you, can you also post a recommended uh, Cholent recipe to go with that YouTube site? I'll, uh, I'll email, email Jared and have him do that. We can do that. We have it. Don't we have it? John, I can forward you the ingredient list. And options, of course, you know, optional extras. Well, no, I have the uh, email. Excellent.